Tjur ma hasa khard. Tam har na shri khana. Back again already. Uh, the video I posted yesterday, though it's probably going to be tomorrow by the time I get this video posted, uh, I spoke about the etymology of the word shnach, fox, and I said that I didn't know it, that I didn't know it. But one of my subscribers, uh, Benedict Yavorsky, forgive my mispronunciation, uh, drew my attention to the fact that only, well, less than a week ago, uh, Professor David Stifter, the, the professor of Old Irish in Maynooth, uh, had posted um, his proposals for the etymology of the word Shnach. And uh, now, I don't use Twitter, and as far as I know, uh, Professor David Stifter doesn't, or Stifter, I won't attempt to pronounce the German. Uh, he doesn't use, or he doesn't post uh, YouTube videos, but perhaps what I'm about to attempt uh, will be so heinous that he will start. Uh, so what I want to do is just to explain why Professor David Stifter's etymology of the word Shanach, uh, well, I, I think it makes perfect sense, uh, but just to explain the details uh, and I'll probably get those wrong. My area of expertise is not uh, Proto-Celtic or uh, Ancient Irish, um, or even, or especially Proto-Indo-European, but I dabble. Uh, so, what I said yesterday, the form of fox was, uh, in Proto-Celtic, would have been something like this. Uh, but this immediately, so Shinnakos, uh, with a, an apical alveolar S, uh, so basically the, the, the tip of the tongue to the gum ridge, which sounds like an English to an English speaker's ear as a, probably like an SH. This is found in many languages, Spanish, well, varieties of Spanish, Castilian, Finnish, a lot of languages, Greek as far as I know. Anyway, that's the S, but this double N, is problematic since it must have arisen from uh, the combination of uh, two other uh, consonants. That's what I. That's what I uh, thought. Since that's normally when we get N in Irish, it's normally the combination of uh, two different consonants where one consonant has assimilated to the N. Indo-European didn't have any long consonants. Uh, this, there are a few expressive words uh, that seem to have had expressive uh, doubling of consonants. So the word for father, atta, uh, the word for poo, uh, kaka, which of course is where we get the Irish word kak. Uh, and, uh, sorry, well I spelled it with double C because that's more etymological. Um, nowadays of course it's just spelled with one C. Um, but in Old Irish it would have been spelled like that uh, occasionally. And... Uh, still, well, uh, Irish in, in Derry and uh, Donegal has preserved uh, these long, well, in areas of Donegal, has preserved the original long vowel of uh, cock with a long, with a long uh, double consonant. But anyway, um, this is also where the Finnish word for poo comes from, uh, but that's probably borrowed from uh, Swedish or Russian. But anyway, um, also, the word, possibly the word mock, we're going off on a tangent already, but sure you love it. Uh, mock should only have uh, one C, since it's it's equivalent, well, it's the proto-Celtic form of it was, uh, I was going to draw a Q, a Q, uh, with rounded lips, uh, which is where we got early uh, British uh, or Britannic mop, which then this P became united. And this is how we get mop. Uh, but the, the, the double K in this word for sun was probably because it's a, a expressive, uh, a term of endearment. In the same way that Atta, the Indo European word for father, had um, this double T. And that word Atta is, as far as I know, related to the word idi meaning a teacher, where we get the word didachos nowadays, education. 
Um, so it went from meaning father to foster father to foster father, somebody who teaches you, and then education and teacher, so on. Anyway, back to Fox. Um, so that's the first problem, this, this double consonant. Where did that come out of? I didn't know. Uh, but the second problem then, um, Old Irish had a system of vowel, what you might call vowel harmony, where, now the rules are complicated, uh, but in general, um, a vowel could change its position, go from a, a high vowel uh, or a closed vowel, same, just same thing, different name, uh, to an open vowel or vice versa, depending. So basically, that this I, in anticipation of the low A, uh, would we'd expect to have changed to E. Now we do get the form nowadays. Um, in modern Irish, Shamach. Now, in Munster, the form is uh, Shnach with the stress on the second syllable. As I said before, um, if all vowels in a word are short uh, and we have second syllable ACH, the stress goes on the, the stress goes on the ACH, um, except in abstract nouns. And, but remember, Bnacht and Malacht are not abstract nouns. Uh, they don't have this abstract uh, uh, suffix. Uh, they're borrowings from Latin. Benedictio, uh, as I said in my video on the, the course from uh, Queen's County. And Malacht. So a, a good saying and a bad saying. But this Acht ending isn't the normal abstract ending, which is why they don't, which is why we still say Bnacht and Malacht with the stress on the second syllable. So, back again to Fox. Um, so, Schnach, this form does exist occasionally uh, in Munster, uh, but it's hard to tell um, because, in any case, if the stress goes on the second syllable, we can't tell whether, whether the first vowel was originally E or E. Rem and remembering that both those vowels are only spelling vowels, even though that this e normally nowadays before a broad consonant has become the sound a, which and the sound a in English is usually spelt with this uh, unetymological vowel, uh, because it is only in the in the Ginnidoch where we have uh, well what was originally e, uh, this fricative y. Uh, which is hardened to um, G in Munster. Uh, and so then, of course, the stress would remain on the first syllable. Shunig, shanig. So it's only in the in the genitive that we can tell if the vowel is A or I. Um, now, so my whole point anyway is that, and as far, in, in Old Irish, as far as I know anyway, the spelling of fox in the nominative, the, the doer of the action, the naming the, the, the doer of the action, roughly speaking, uh, was spelt like that. I don't know of any form in Old Irish that was spelt as that, which is the but Well, this immediately gives a clue to, was it uh, Cormac Glossary and his proposal of what Shanach meant, and we're coming to Professor Stifter's um, proposal for the etymology, we're getting there. Um, Cormac suggested that it meant uh, an old one, the old one. Uh, of course, we have nowadays the word Nyach, um, Shen meaning old, uh, in Old Irish, and nowadays we have this dummy vowel, and this, this E before the broad consonant has become the sound uh, A, which again happens to be spelt with uh, this letter in English. Um, but this this meaning of the old one is exactly what Professor Stifter has suggested. And immediately when I saw his um, his proposal uh, on Twitter, uh, I yeah, I mean, well, I, I am in no place to to argue with him, but. Uh, just to, as I said, explain the details. I think it's it's 
it perfectly solves the, the, the issue of the etymology. Uh, so, where are we going to go with this? Okay, so, um, what Professor Stifter's um, proposal is, is that Old Irish Shinnach, uh, which was stressed on the first syllable and would have had a long N, Shinnach, um, was that it comes from uh, a proto Celtic Shenu uh, Na course. Now, this word can be broken up into a number of bits. Uh, this A course ending uh, is, well, sorry, let's start with the start. Uh, Sen, as we said, means old, uh, where we get the old Irish word for old, Shen, uh, in the British or Britannic, uh, British languages, uh, Welsh, Cornish, and uh, Breton, bearing in mind that there is possibly a worthwhile distinction to be made between British and Britain-ish. Britain-ish meaning from the island of Britain, but not necessarily culturally British, which is a Celtic term. Um, I'm being provocative. Hain, <laughs> uh, uh, since S became H in the British languages. Uh, now, this O part is very interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this now. Um, so, Indo-European had this uh, system of stems. Or, well, I should explain the form of Indo-European words, uh, as I understand it. So, Indo-European words, Proto-Indo-European words, had uh, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, the, be the, the, the start uh, was um, called the root. Uh, the middle, or the, if you would like to call it the, the midriff, this word riff actually being related to the Latin word uh, corpus, from where we get the Irish word corpus. Uh, cor uh, which is called the stem. Uh, and then finally we had what uh, we call the end, the ending, uh, and that's a dissonance, not to be confused with the musical term dissonance. Uh, but basically you can take these words root, stem and dissonance just to mean the start, the middle or the body riff the body of the word and the end of the word. Uh, the end of the word contained the usually the well I should again start at the start. Um, the root in Indo-European roots themselves couldn't function as uh, independent words whereas in Uralic uh, so the language family that uh, includes uh, the ones that are immediately mentioned normally are Finnish, Estonian, and Hungarian, but there are many more languages. Uh, Southern Estonian is, uh, uh, well, actually, Southern Estonian is in many ways more like Finnish than Northern Estonian. Um, Votic, uh, Inkeri, uh, Karelian, the Sami languages are another branch, um, but they're, they're often left out of the loop. And then, of course, within Russia, there are many many other uh, Uralic languages related to the European ones. Uh, sorry, I digress. Uh, so the, the root itself couldn't function as a word. It always had to have, an ex well, these extra bits. That's the technical term, bits. Um, so, stem. Oh yes, so the, well, this is the interesting part. Uh, we'll come back and talk about this in a second. And then the ending. The dissonance uh, was the, the 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 role of the word. For example, depending on the dissonance, uh, well, I won't go into details, but uh, this os ending here, for example, sometimes without the um, could often mean the, the the doer of the action, um, whereas an ending like. Uh, uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, meant the undergoer. And notice, 
uh, as I go on a brief tangent about English spelling, uh, that doer and goer don't rhyme. Uh, I'll talk some 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 time about my my own recommendations for an English spelling reform. Uh, you have my permission to spell them as doer and uh, goer, but until my spelling suggestions are accepted uh, wholeheartedly by all thinking people, you have my permission to pronounce goer as goer <laughs> and under goer. <laughs> Uh, sounds slightly lewd. Anyway, uh, we'll get back to Fox soon enough, for Fox's sake. Um, no, so, uh, Professor Stifter has, once during the video, I'll try to pronounce his name correctly, um, has suggested, and it would seem that he's right, I would think, uh, that this word means, well, it means the old one, but that's related to the word for uh, the River Shannon, the longest river in Ireland, um, the longest river in the Celtic Isles. Um, and of course, the, I mean, the, the word uh, referring to a river as the old one, has a, a very famous parallel in English, Old Man River. Um, so it wouldn't at all be strange to call it the old one. And actually, as far as, far as I know, most rivers in Ireland are uh, have feminine names. The only one off the top, the only masculine named river I can think of off the top of my head is the Solan in Cork. Um, and actually, there's a poem written about that. Is I forget who wrote it now, but. Uh, Mission Sulan for Father Fidden. A Nishan Taum Kailandinya. Um something like that. Uh, which of course explicitly mentions Fidden, uh, masculine. Uh, now so to talk about uh, this uh, bit of the word now, um Shenu and its root. This is interesting. Um, so, I think we're wasting away. <laughs> uh, the word would originally have been the old one. Uh, different parts here. Uh, sen, uh, on, and then s would have marked the nominative. Uh, now, the, there was a rule in uh, very early Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European, uh, called uh, Semerenyi's law, or Semerenyi's lengthening. He was a, a, a Hungarian linguist. And what the law, the, the law, what the law proposes, uh, or notices rather, uh, is that um, when we had a vowel before uh, a sonorant, no, okay, to talk about sonorants, sonorants and fricatives. Um, you'll remember from my watching my previous videos uh, the different categories of sounds. Uh, so here we have the plosives, the, the p exploding sounds. Although the word explode originally meant to, to someone uh, to applaud off the stage, to explode them. Um, anyway. Uh, B D Buddha go. Now, so here at this stage we we tend to get into the uh, well. This is the sonorant or resonant. Some people would distinguish between the two. I haven't made up my mind yet. Um, but these sounds basically are well. We do have other sounds in the middle in the what's called the sonority hierarchy. Sonority. Sonority hierarchy. Um, no, sorry, I want to make room for the the. Um, the oh, they won't. Okay, I'll just squeeze them in. But here we have all these v, uh, f, uh, v, 
<laughs> They're in between, but we don't need to worry about those. Anyway, uh, mo, lo, no, ro, and then also we have we get into what are called semi-vowels or uh, approximants. But well, these can be approximants too. But or even if approximant forms them. What an approximant is uh, is that the articulators or the mouth parts approach, approximate. They come close to each other, but they don't touch uh, enough to cause friction. So, for example, um, you probably know from watching my previous videos that. Uh, what is nowadays spelt BH in Irish should be pronounced as as an ovo his cow uh, should be pronounced with a v a bilabial fricative, not a v which is a labio dental lip to teeth v as in English uh, a labio dental fricative, but in Spanish, for example, a uh, Castilian. Uh, I drink. Those two B's are, have different pronunciation. And notice it's pronunciation, not pronunciation. It's because of a, a, a phenomenon in English known as trisyllabic lexing. I'll come back and talk about it another time. Um, but this B, much like Chevu uh, originally rose in the Celtic languages, uh, when it was between vowels, it became softened. But in Irish, it's become a fricative. Uh, so the close contact has just loosened enough uh, to let through some air, but the, 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 the blockage is still so close that it produces friction. Um, well, sorry, the, the blockage just produces friction. But with the Spanish, uh, the second B uh, is, what, well, I suppose there's no international phonetic symbol for it so, properly as far as I know, but... Uh, it's, uh, these are often used to lower fricatives to, to show that there's uh, less friction. Um, so you could have a hierarchy, for example, of... Uh, oh, lads, I've gone way off the point. <laughs> stay with me, stay with me. Um, so degrees of friction, for example, uh, lowered, then the fricative, uh, and then the B itself. Uh, now, voicing is... Spectral, it's what's called voice, um, voice timing onset. Um, but basically, that's roughly the scale of just bilabial consonants, just using the lips. Uh, so we're getting louder as we go up. Um, basically, as there's less blockage of the air coming from or into the lungs. Uh, ingressive and uh, egressive uh, pulmonic air flow. Um, Ingressive mean going in, egressive going out. Uh, aggressive meaning going to. Anyway, uh, where have we gone at all? Oh yes, so the whole point is that <laughs> these, these resonant or sonorant sounds here. So basically, M, N, U, which is written as ng normally because the Latin alphabet that we currently use uh, doesn't use this ng or ung symbol. Anyway, the rule was when there was a vowel followed by a resonant or a sonant followed by a fricative, uh, this vowel became long. Now I'm going to, sorry, I have to go up and talk about just one other small point. Um, so, S is a fricative, of course, there's friction. Uh, s, or an Indo European, this was probably, sh, again, this ap apical alveolar uh, grooved fricative. Uh, but there were also, if you ever look at Proto Indo European, you might often see all these, these H's, uh, which are called laryngeals. Uh, and they were first proposed, as far as I know. Yeah, it was. What am I saying? Uh, and again, forgive my pronunciation. Uh, by Ferdinand de Saussure. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it was only 21 or 22 when he proposed them, and they were first rejected. But they, they, these have a very interesting story in Proto and European. Uh, the sounds that I suppose are most are proposed for these nowadays, they weren't actually H. This is just a symbol. Uh, some people have suggested that this was H. Uh, they've disappeared, well, I, again, so, okay, I won't go off and talk about these too much, but they've disappeared 
from all Indo European languages, but when they discovered Hittite, they discovered that two of these still actually survived. Um, but anyway, so this is phonetically was probably, or I'm slightly more inclined to think that it was so like a, like a slender CH sound in Irish. Uh, uh, this one was a uvular, or one of the proposals was that it was uh, a uvular fricative. Notice that this is slightly deeper than uh, the broad Irish CH, which is just um, in Welsh, the CH is uvular usually. Uh, and this was um, voiced and rounded, so uh, like in some dialects of Parisian, commonly known or misknown as French. Uh, so these, these are, are all fricative sounds. Now, actually, just a quick word about H. Uh, it's not a fricative, technically speaking. It's a glottal continuant. Or it's, well, some people call it a glottal transition. I don't like that term. Uh, so it's a continuable sound as long as you have air. Um, but what's different with H is that it's all, all that sound is is the vocal fold, folds wide apart and just air coming up. There's no blockage at any stage in the vocal tract except at the glottis, if you consider that blockage. Um, which I'm sure as respectable people you don't. Um, so H isn't a, isn't a fricative. And this is why so many sounds can become H, because as soon as you lose the oral uh, contact, basically, between the articulators, the parts of the mouth, once they stop touching, uh, and if the voice is, if the sound is unvoiced, uh, well, like F, F is unvoiced, S is unvoiced, uh, once it loses the contact, and once the, the mouth parts stop touching, all that remains is this open glottis that makes these sounds voiceless in the first place, uh, non-vibrating. Um, right, hold on, let's add Jesus, this is a great ramble. Uh, and he thought I was getting good yesterday. <laughs> Um, where are we? Oh yeah, right. How are we doing for time? I want to speed on. Um, anyway, so the rule was uh, vowel, sonorant, fricative, that the vowel uh, became long. Now, usually, uh, Semerenyi's law is proposed from as far as I know, and I don't know very far, uh, that the fricative disappeared with compensatory lengthening of the, of the preceding vowel. Now, what I would think myself, and I'm in no position to, uh, well, take what I'm about to say with a pinch of salt. I would think that the vowel became long first and only later, um, the, or perhaps soon afterwards, perhaps in the next generation of speakers. But in any case, the result is the same. Uh, only then did the fricative disappear. Um, again, I'm in no real position to say, but that, that's my, my uh, phonetician's intuition. Um, not so much of a phonetician either, but... Uh, then the next step was that uh, in after long vowels disappeared, so we were left with Shano. Uh, Shano. Now, uh, in Indo European, or at least in insular, in Indo European, in Proto Celtic, so the ancestor of the, the, all the Celtic languages, uh, or at least in insular Celtic, which is one of the proposals for the ancestor of the Celtic spoken in the Celtic Isles, um, Shano. Uh, uh, um, sorry, I don't actually think it should be called the Celtic Isles, but I won't, I won't talk about that in this video. We'll never get this finished. Um, so O became O. Now, this only happened um, in... Well, what, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll show the parallel with the, with the genitive. Uh, if I can trace it. Uh, I, should, I meant to say at the start of the video, perhaps I did or perhaps I didn't. Uh, look at the the uh, description box 
and I'll put any corrections that anyone is able to offer, I'll put those in the description box. Um, yeah, and have a look at my other, I, I intend on, on filling out the description boxes of my other videos as well, so look there for corrections. Uh, as my great-grandfather used to say, you can't take back the spoken word. <laughs> um, anyway, so this would have been the nominative, the doer, the goer of the action. Uh, but as the genitive would have been seno nos, so root, stem, and uh, genitive ending, os. Uh, am I correct in that? I think I am. No. So here, because the resonant, or the sonorant, the, the frictionless continuant, or continuable, uh, was not immediately followed by a fricative sound. S, sh, uh, Semarani's law didn't apply. So this would have gone on to have been... Oh no, I think I'm going to get lost here now. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to get lost here now. This, this, we're at, we're at the, the, the boundaries of my knowledge now of, of Proto-Indo-European. Um, that should have given something like okay no we're going to have to forget that uh, anyway but basically because Semarenyi's law didn't apply there would still have been an N in in uh, what did that have caused rising? someone can correct me anyway uh, but this is why we get uh, now. So going back to our thing about vowels and the, the changing of height, oo is a long vowel. So in anticipation of the of the coming oo, the e raised to the same height as the oo. You'll have to pretend that they're at the same height in the bow. Uh, or this only applied to short vowels. So this would have become. Uh, she knew uh, this would have become become <laughs> uh, uh, she knew. Now, this in modern Irish, uh, we eventually lost the distinction in unstressed syllables between short vowels. So there would have been in in, in, in old Irish a difference between when a word ended in uh, in a weak syllable, uh, uh, she knew. Or then, for example, shino, just making that up, uh, shinna. Uh, but this was lost in Middle Irish, or Middle Gaelic, Gaelic, Gaelic. Uh, but this would nowadays be written as S-I-O-N-A. Now, that's the regular derivation of, of the nominative word for the River Shannon. But if we can go back over here, what's wrong with me now that I can't tell you that? I used to be able to do it. Oh, yes, hold on there now. Uh, no, I'm still, still a bit lost. Um, basically, anyway, with apocope, which is the loss of the loss of uh, final syllables, we would have something like Shenon. Uh, 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 but as far as I know, the old Irish genitive, well, those two, well should have been silsinon. But I'm not sure why this a, this e has raised to e. Um, again, someone can correct me in the in the um, comments. Possibly by analogy with the nominative. Uh, but there might be some other reason behind it as well. Uh, in any case. So somehow, magically, ignoring my ignorance, um, we would have ended up with that form. Although this form would, would regularly have led to the pronunciation Shannon. Uh, and this is where things become complicated, slash interesting. Um, now, there was a rule in Old Irish that uh, were called McNeil's or McNeil's law, where if an unstressed syllable began with a 
sonorant or resonant. So again, just to remind you, uh, that means the nasal sounds uh, L, R, and arguably W and U, but they don't really come into it. Um, remembering that these, of course, had two forms in Irish, strong and weak. At this stage, weak M had become a fricative, so this was out of the picture because the whole, one of the defining, well, the, the definition of a resonant is that it's a, a frictionless continuant, that there's no friction, whereas this, at this stage, would have been, M shave at this stage would have had friction. Uh, whereas N shave, if I can write it singularly, when this would have been written double, uh, would have had uh, still a sonorant, of course, and the same goes for uh, L, uh, or uh, LL and R, single R and double R, whatever. Anyway, the rule was, McNeil's law, that when the syllable began with the resonant, uh, or was it just, yeah, uh, that the a, a following resonant underwent, um, or at least N and L, underwent uh, dissimilation. So we, here we have single N, single N, which would have become single N, double N. Uh, and we see this nowadays in uh, the word for, uh, what's that about this? Uh, this is still today, I'll come back and make a proper video about uh, when I'm talking about the, the genitive case, but, uh, so, uh, the word for Ireland, uh, Aden, the old dative case is now used instead of the, the nominative case in spoken, most spoken dialects. Um, but, so Aden, now this itself has a complicated history. Uh, roughly, well in old Irish it was um, area. O, where this O was still pronounced, area, but a short O, not an O, area, um, which is now the name of a very important uh, journal. Uh, and this itself comes from a slightly controversial uh, he, were, uh, now, so the nominative would have been puer yons. This O would have been become long, the S was lost, then the N was lost after a long vowel. Uh, in Celtic, uh, so O became U. Uh, but this is, well, this is where we also get the, the Welsh word, Iwerth uh, von, where the, the, double, the double D uh, is really just one sound, uh, O-N. Now, there are problems with this because of this long vowel. Uh, only only short vowels lowered, um, only short vowels lowered, so we shouldn't have Ada, uh, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not the person to answer that, but that's where it comes from, and this comes itself from uh, uh, an Indo-European word, Piwa, uh, or Piwe, I think meaning fat, uh, anyway, we won't go off and talk about the other Indo-European languages. Uh, but anyway, my whole point is that uh, Ada, in the genitive case, it's an N stem, which means that the N reappears in all the conjugated classes, you would accept the, the nominative. Uh, Ada, no. So first of all, it's an N stem, so we put on an N to form the genitive of Ireland. Ada. But, because the, the unstressed syllable begins with the sonorant, this weak sonorant, there's only one of them, doubles. Adam. Uh, this happens in a, a number of words. This is why, uh, like the name Donald, uh, has double L, although you see different variant spellings of it nowadays. But we don't get McNeil's law, uh, for example, in the word for uh, uh, Scotland. Again, nowadays we use the dative case um, on the point. Uh, but the, the old nominative, uh, Alaba, which in Scotland is pronounced as Alaba in most dialects. Oh, okay, well, I won't go off and talk about that. But, um, 
Whereas again, this is an n stem, so the genitive adds n. Uh, but because b is not a sonorant, it's a plosive, so it's not a, it's not a continuous, frictionless sound, uh, MacNeil's law uh, or didn't apply. Um, I wanted to talk a lot more about the word fox. <laughs> uh, now, again, the same story. Nowadays, shunna, if you see shunna at all, rather than shun shunna, um, you'll see it with double N. What I think that is, is confusion. Oh, I never, I never went through. Oh, sorry, I'll have to, uh, for God's sake. Uh, I'll have to explain this. Um, <laughs> I'll have to, I'm very bad. Um, okay, sorry, I wanted to have to abort this, or I don't know how to type. Uh, so, this was the word Shannon and N stems and uh, Semerenis law, uh, but to actually finish this point, um, and I've, it's all been building up to this moment, you see, suspense. Um, now, so uh, skipping some of the points and fusing some of the sound changes into, well, simultaneous uh, changes, um, a anticipation of the high of the high uh, oo, so e eh, rose to its uh, rose in position to e, uh, n. Uh, the vowel became short, cutting out stages there. Uh, the vowel became short. As I mentioned in my video, I think was it on the, the courses, um, this has, has given us the, the modern Irish, ach, where the uh, well, if I write a, a, a G, a C, and a, a C punk, uh, in the Gaelic, Gaelic, Gaelic languages, this k sound has become a k when it was single between vowels. Whereas in the British languages, uh, it originally first became uh, probably something like og with a G, uh, and then in Cornish and Breton it became er. Uh, uh, so, for example, the Breton word for big, uh, they could all spell it like that still. And Maur, okay, I won't go off and talk about that yet, but uh, anyway. So, single consonant between two vowels, that's the where chevu, softening, uh, originally applied. So, well, I'll spell it for the moment, I'll spell it with uh, an X. That's the sound it became. Uh, and the unstressed S would have become H. I'm combining a lot of changes there now, just for the sake of getting through it. Uh, next step. Uh, so about, Kenneth Jackson proposed, was it the year 500? Uh, apocope, so the last of final syllables. occurred. so that would have given us Sinu uh, Nach uh, uh, and this gone. Right? Uh, the next, around five... Uh, 550, 550, um, syncope, so the loss of even numbered syllables except the last. So one, two, gone, uh, this vowel had already disappeared. Uh, and of course now this is gone, so in Old Irish this was spelt as uh, this uh, sound was spelt in Old Irish, borrowing a convention from uh, Latin, which itself was borrowed from Greek, uh, uh, that's roughly how we got from this word, the old one, uh, to this. Now, I've heard people laugh about the more common word for fox uh, in Irish. Uh, now, well, this is actually one of the big uh, dialectal uh, Features. The mother uh, is the normal word in Connacht, and well, this is the question. The word really perhaps should be uh, mother with the, this old the because uh, this was pronounced as W, well, it still is pronounced in Ulster. Um, so if you're from Ulster, uh, write mother with the, the nowadays the DH. Uh, but this went down as far as, as Longford, of course. Um, and it seems that this, this 
in, in the Connacht dialects, this DH, of course, has disappeared. Uh, but in more northern dialects, this DH became a W sound. And actually, within the county Longford, um, in the northeast, was it, oh, I'm going to think for name now, Bridget Fulham, I think her name was, uh, from the parish of Grenard, she pronounced this as Madu, uh, Madu, whereas in the southwest, what was his name? Peter Skelly from Derry, was it? Derry, Derry Dara, I think. Uh, he pronounced it as Madu with the Connacht, with the the, the Connacht pronunciation. Uh, so within the one county, the, the the divide between this feature must have occurred somewhere in Longford. Um, but this, this seems to have been found even in uh, North Dublin. Uh, anyway, but people laugh at the idea of it being uh, the red dog, and that should have a D-punk still, or a D-H. It's just this, again, one of the idiotic spelling manglings of the Kaidan the Figul. Um, spell it with a D-H, I'll come back and explain why you know the time. Uh, well, exactly, so... Well, you do find even the, the name Madha used in, in Kerry, for example, Pluish, uh, Vada uh, Ruig. Uh, Ruig, again, so slenderizing this, uh, but where Madha is understood as not having any ending. Uh, so, Vada Ruig. Um, but Madha in Monster, anyway, is the, the more common term. But this Ro ending would originally have been R A D H or R A D Shave which itself would have derived from this word re, as in the running of, or like a stampede of, meaning a collective term, uh, a group of. But this, this then spread outside, even in Old Irish, had already spread outside, uh, specifically referring to a stampede or a, a group of animals or whatever. Uh, no, but this is very interesting. We have this concept in linguistics called, uh, well, avoidance speech, or what's called a, a Noah name, basically an avoidance name or a taboo name. The old one, presumably referring to a fox's uh, beard, um, was used because the usual word for fox was thought to bring bad luck. Uh, and of course, uh, perhaps some of you know that red-haired women uh, were or are considered bad luck, but so too was, I presume, perhaps this, which originally became a Noah name, um, or a t taboo name, or a, well, an avoidance name. So this was, would have been used to avoid saying the real word for fox. So people would have stopped calling it the red dog, or, an, um, well, exactly. Well, Rua, kind of brownie red, but anyway, colours in language are a complicated thing. Uh, but then, possibly, this word itself became taboo, and this became the Noah name, Madhura Rua. Uh, right, is there anything else I want to say about that? Madhura, it seems, uh, was used in Carlo, and uh, now it's hard to tell whether it was understood as Madhura with the DH or Madhura without the DH, uh, because even in the genitive, uh, on the... Uh, well, I just... Uh, of, the, and we know that masculine on puts a shavu from watching my video yesterday. Uh, on, uh, va, no, in Munster that would be on vadig, but in, in Leinster it seems that uh, both broad dh and slender dh, or d shave is a better term, uh, would have been silent, so we can't tell. Uh, but there are quite a number of planes. Uh, I think in, in, in Wexford there's an example of a place it was called, uh, or at least it was in my local place named Glan No. Uh, it was written by, by the man that wrote it. Maradurten te durte. Glan No Madu. Madu was used in Mead um, as plural, uh, genitive plural, Bail um, Madu. Uh, I'll add all uh, more information anyway in the description box. I better shut up. Uh, that was a fine miss. Uh, like and subscribe. I'll go slow and go forward.